So tonight um, we, we ran through our new format last week so for people who weren't here. We're going to change our news item slightly. We're going to still have Bob, who's going to give us some headline news. And then we're going to invite all of you to share anything that might have either something else nationally significant or something that's happened locally um, that you'd like to share with us. Following that, we have uh, Graham Cooper, who is one of our regulars from Bolton this week, who's going to talk about his experience of submitting footage to the police. And we are really pleased that we have Mark Hodson here also, who will help with fielding questions. And then finally, we have our new slot, which is, our, I can't remember what the working title was now, the, the, the good, the bad and the interesting, I think. Uh, we're gonna, we have a new infrastructure slot by um, Mark, aka Ranty Highwayman, who's going to, uh, we'll, we'll finish that off with that at the end. This is uh, the first of our new format uh, news update. We're now doing uh, basically news headlines, three each week, and I'll say um, little things about each of the three things. So it's a different format from before. I hope that's all streamlined. Um, and uh, first thing, I'm still referring to Kiev because of uh, it's been terribly important. He lies behind all the things that are going on at the moment. And uh, I did pick up this on how some people on bicycles came and uh, captured a Russian tank. Also, Michael Colvin Anderson is um, involved in sending bikes to Ukraine with that, if you want to get involved. Um, OK, so new format, start off with the three issues. Uh, first thing is about money for active travel. What's going to happen is the critical thing. Active Travel England is set up. Uh, there are equivalents in the region in, in, the, in Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. Um, what's going to happen? Uh, it did look bad in, in London, but it's not as bad as, uh, as appeared. Uh, read the article by Simon Monk uh, on uh, London. Uh, uh, it's also connected to the self-assessment form which went out to local authorities from Active Travel England, which you can see there. This is a big issue. Of, um, local authorities will have to tell Active Travel England what they've been doing. And that will be critical. So watch this space. Right, number two. Uh, there was a lot of stuff about the number of people cycling in England fell a year after the £2 billion plan for active travel. Um, however, other things were down as well. Chris Boardman has commented on that. And uh, there were those things happening and uh, uh, he uh, said it wasn't quite as bad as uh, might have been the case. Um, right, the final thing I want to talk about is uh, uh, recently Chris Baldwin said, we don't want a culture war. Um, this happened when all the nonsense about bicycle number plates came out. And that's the thing for us to think about. Um, we probably don't want to fight a culture war. However, we may have to. We may have to at least educate ourselves because the culture wars, uh, and I'm referring again specifically to all the rubbish about bicycle number plates, do come. And I think we have to know how to respond. Um, so the thing in The Guardian, The Guardian, uh, implicates that it's the fault of cyclists that there is anti-cycling hatred um this is from a woman in the in the, the telegraph saying that uh uh you know we can get the people who oppose ltns to vote tory it's the one hope for the tories that there is um and so this kind of stuff will be coming up. I personally think we have to equip ourselves and how we conduct ourselves in this sort of cultural uh, arena is crucial. Um, because I think even if you're aiming for just very narrow, limited changes in infrastructure, actually being able to get them implemented properly 
requires that constant effort by polit politicians, a constant level of commitment, and we have to be there to remind them and ourselves of um, the rights that people who walk and cycle uh, do legally have and should have. And um, so, yeah, we'll come back to this, but I think we do have to be prepared for cultural war. We do have to be well educated and we have to be able to inform everybody accordingly. There's a reading list. I'll be putting the reading list up separately under the new format. And that's it. Thanks very much, everybody. Nice to see you again. Thanks, Bob. And it's really great to have you back. Um, has anybody got anything to add to Bob's news or news, local news that you'd like to share? There's a couple of things, I think. The first is that next weekend is another International Critical Mass Weekend. So there'll be critical mass taking place across the country. There's one, definitely one in Newcastle on Saturday and one in North Tyneside on Sunday. I'm sure others um, might, might like to contribute places and dates uh, in the chat for theirs. Um, we did have something else that I wanted to highlight, but Amy, do you want to go? Oh, yeah, I just wanted to mention a few blogs that Action Vision Zero has produced. Um, it covers the latest roads policing officer stats, shows how um, few they've actually increased. Then we've also done blogs about the number of uh, court prosecutions, convictions, and what sentences they got in 2021. We also did a blog on driving bans, which showed that it's gone up to 14%. Um, That's mainly due to the increase in drug driving uh, convictions. And the analysis shows, again, how rare it is for a speeding conviction or careless driving con conviction to result in a ban. And if you can look on those blogs and see um, the stats for your police service. Um, and then lastly, we also did a blog about the sentencing consultation on motoring offenses, because we think the proposals are too hard on causing death and serious injury by careless driving. And uh, we're in the process of organizing a uh, panel debate on that for next month. And I'll have more information about that next week. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Amy. Yeah, if you could share those those links in the chat, that would be great as well. Um, Paul. Uh, hi, I didn't want to just uh, spam something in the link. Um, I've um, put together like a little website for uh, creating your own little um, active travel maps. You can kind of put um, modal filters and cycle lanes and tram lanes and uh, pedestrianised streets. So I don't know if anyone's interested in having a play with that. It's um, I got bored of um, having to use paint to uh, produce uh, re responses to council consultations on the proposed LTNs and stuff. So I've just written it myself. It's just a little website. So I don't, don't know if anyone's interested. So. Yeah, yeah, if you're able to, to, to give us a link, that sounds great. I mean, actually, it'd be interesting to, to probably do a session on different ways of mapping and visualisation. So perhaps that's something that we could come back to you on. Yeah, cool. Well, I've, I've posted a link in the... Um, yeah, in brilliant. The Thank you. It's all open source as well, so you can see what the code does. But yeah, yeah any problems? Thanks. Ping me. Thanks. Um, Max. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, just uh notice well just, no there is on thursday it's world car free day and i just wondered how many people here whose local authorities is actually closing any roads to through traffic uh there aren't any in brighton and hove to my knowledge in fact it's very weak um uh the council's been very weak surprisingly weak um anybody want to put their hands up or to um or, or to say if they've got uh any roads being closed to motor traffic on car free day on thursday one one person is that all in the whole of the uk wow but it isn't on car free day max it's actually at the weekend i mean i've noticed from everything i've looked at that nearly everywhere is offering that you can have a residential street party for free but not on main roads and not on car national car free day it's very disappointing Oh, OK. Well, obviously, there's work to be done across Britain ready for next year. Thanks. That's all. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's something else that um, Camden cyclists have raised with us. Uh, or in fact, no, Islington cyclists have raised for us. 
um, the Islington and Camden will be uh, doing a make the lane protest to highlight uh, the lack of safe infrastructure on key routes on Old Street to Hoban. So that's eight o'clock on Thursday. You want me to say a couple of words about that, Sally? It's Sally yeah, here from Cycle do. Islington. Hi there, everybody. Um, so we actually did a make the lane back in 2019 when we were highlighting the fact that in spite of promises from Camden and Camden and Islington councils, nothing had actually been done on a key east-west cycling route, which is uh, Old Street down to Holborn. And we thought that now that the active that the active walking funding, active travel funding, sorry, has been agreed, and there is, I believe, 80 million being put aside for active travel in London. I hope that figures right. It was a good time to uh, knock on Will Norman's door and say, hey there, nothing has been done about this route. There have been uh, over 200 incidents. Three women have lost limbs on that route in the last six years. We want something to be done about it. And so Cyclistington and Camden Cyclists, both of whom are the local borough groups of the London Cycling Campaign, uh, have got together and we've got this protest on Thursday morning. If anybody is around and can either help to make the lane or cycle through the lane, we'd love to have you there if you could get there for about 10 to 8 in the morning. Uh, and, and we hope to make a big noise with the up with uh, an email campaign um, about ring fencing some of the 80 million for that particular route. So that's what's happening. The reason I've got a lot to say is that I do want to say a little bit about the history and how we've got to where we where we are. Um, and I've called it a brief history of crime. My apologies to uh, Stephen Hawking. Um, this is from my perspective. It's very much a Greater Manchester perspective with a little bit of Lancashire thrown in. Uh, but I do want to see how far we've come because I think we've got an awful long way to go, but we're, you know, we're not starting right from the beginning. So for me, it started in uh, 2010, fed up of uh, incidents on the roads. Uh, and it was actually an incident where I got left hooked that caused me to buy my first cheap camera. Uh, the quality was rubbish. That's a nighttime picture. And my ability to collect evidence was, was pretty poor. But the ability of the police to respond to that evidence was also poor. And there were all sorts of, um, of cases that were just being knocked back uh, that were clear cut. I mean, this guy was uh, on his news, reading his newspaper whilst driving and cut me up in the, uh, in the inside lane. This one hits, hit myself and my daughter. That's my daughter's leg on the bottom right of the um, of the left hand picture. Um, no further action. No serious injury. Uh, as if to as if if it were two cars involved, then um, then we wouldn't be involved. So why now? False equivalency. I think Bob would recognise that. Road rage incidents, same sorts of things. So I'm not going to go into detail on those. But at the same time as all that was happening, the police were concentrating on a thing called Operation Grimaldi. And that was basically about protecting cyclists by clamping down on them, finding them for going across pavements and stuff like that. Uh, and there was a huge amount of prejudice. Uh, there was two PCSOs came to our cycle forum and uh, gave us examples of the problems they were having with cyclists, like a cyclist that rode across Victoria Square and snatched a woman's handbag. This is incredibly prejudicial. And uh, so there was a lot of backlash about, uh, about that. And I actually did a, a complaint to the professional standards had the same arguments about road position and stuff like that with it now at inspector level. Um, but the, the police did actually respond. And uh, there were two key meetings in 2014 um, that, um, that I was at because I was involved with the Greater Manchester Cycle Campaign. And uh, at those meetings, the, the second one, and we'd asked for, for some things to happen at the first one. The second one, they said, we're scrapping Operation Grimaldi and we're going to create Operation Considerate. And that's where Operation Considerate came from. And um, it was really shifting the attention. And that, that was great. We had asked for things like plainclothes officers on bicycles and they'd done a risk assessment and uh, couldn't do that. Far too risky to put police officers in plainclothes on bicycles on the public highway. Um, well, <laughs> yeah, you don't say... Um, so anyway, there was a big publicity campaign and there was a Crime Watch Roadshow that uh, they came up for, uh, for three days and I was actually involved in that. And there were some officers involved in that with, from the Serious Collision Investigation Unit who were to prove uh, pivotal in the changes that were going to happen. Uh, Stephanie Payne there and uh, Gareth Walker, who were, the, who were two PCSOs, traffic PCSOs, and um, Inspector Paul Rowe. And they really 
got the thing off the ground. And as it happened, uh, Gareth was the same person that showed so much prejudice at our, um, our cycle forum. So he'd had a sort of Damascene conversion in this time. And he proved to be a real champion for us. So we started having successes with Section 59 warnings, in other words, effectively a motoring ASBO, for what are quite serious cases, actually. I mean, this one was, uh, was a potentially uh, a potential for injury is quite significant there. Um, another one there, a warning letter was sent. Um, the officer considered that uh, only a warning was required. Uh, no crime had been committed. This was deliberate, a road rage punishment pass. So, so those sorts of things were going on. And then something happened that was like a light coming on in the dark. And it was, uh, it was actually um, Mark, who is here with us tonight, and, uh, and Steve Hudson. And they produced their, uh, their blog, a famous blog article called Junction Malfunction and the New Dawn. And it was fantastic because they were talking about evidence-based policy policing, focusing on those able to do the most harm, prioritizing danger over vexation, education and enforcement. And they introduced close pass operations, which was exactly what we'd been asking two years previously, uh, Greater Manchester Police to do. And following quite quickly on from that, Greater Manchester Police did indeed do that. And it was actually Gareth and Steph who were riding bicycles on the road in relatively plain clothes. Um, and in the trial run that they did on St. Helens Road in Bolton, uh, there's actually a video that says it was Blackburn Road, but it wasn't, it was St. Helens Road. Um, he actually experienced some quite bad road rage and uh, this guy was flashing his lights and sounding his horn and tailgating and so on. And Paul Rowe said, our warning to reckless drivers is that the next cyclist you overtake could be a police officer. So this was the start of a, of a really uh, significant change. And then following close on the heels of that, there was online video submission. And this is where, where the thing started from in Greater Manchester. Um, it was already happening in other parts of the country, including West Midlands. Now, uh, the trial started in early April and it was myself and a number of other people in Greater Manchester that were, uh, were contributing to that. They'd asked us to, um, to join in. It was based on email. You sent an email to an address, a not considerate address, and then they sent a link to a place to upload your video and um, a blank uh, statement form. And again, it was on Crime Watch Roadshow, and uh, that's Gareth being interviewed, that's Steph being close past. past. Uh, the producer had asked if the person who was going to come on could come in his cycling gear, which I did. Uh, I agreed to do that, and there I am being interviewed in my cycling gear. Uh, they got to deal with that particular prejudice, I think. And that was quite successful. I mean, in that first three months, um, I asked Steph to give me the, the, uh, the, the, the figures and 39 cases actually were going through for to be um, to be dealt with. 23 of those notices of intended prosecution and one of the drivers insisted on having his day in court. Uh, and that was this chap. Um, and uh, he did a close pass about 30 miles an hour, 60 centimetres away, uh, wanted to go to court and talked about the fact that his car was on his drive all the time, it wasn't his car. There was a distinctive pillow in the back of the, uh, of the car, which uh, was there in his car when the police went to see him. So uh, anyway, the magistrates decided he was driving without due care and attention, was uh, given three pence of penalty points on his licence and £825 total in fines and costs. Now, one thing I want to draw attention to on this picture is the evidence, the evidential value of this particular video, because it just so happened that when this overtake happened, there was some very clear markings. That's a bus stop. And these markings are standardised according to the traffic signs regulations and general directions. A metre line, a metre gap and a metre line. And I actually went out and measured this one and it is actually correct. So we knew exactly how far away the thing was. But I'd started to get interested in what was um, what constitutes good quality evidence. And, and I think we have to remember that police and courts are not actually measuring the distance here. They're actually just using judgment based on a video. So I did some little experiments using my own car to, um, to look at what it looked like at different di uh, passing distances. And that's what it looks like. And actually it is with a bit of training, it's actually possible to tell quite um, well how far away a car was from those pictures, but you need the training. I did a blog article on that, which, can, which is linked to in there. But I also did a little experiment to see how other people would fare on this. And I put one of those pictures online on Twitter and asked people, how far away do you think that was? And 55% of the 205 respondents got it right, but over a third thought it was half that distance. And four of the respondents thought it was two meters, not one meter. So obviously some training is required to be able to, uh, to do this. The other thing I looked at was field of view. 
Um, this picture here is in 720p format, which is 8, uh, 1280 by 720. Um, the case in question was actually taken forward for prosecution, um, but it wasn't on the basis of that format. The camera I was using at the time had 960p format, which is 1280 by 960. So you can actually see a lot more information at the bottom of the screen. And I think getting the bike in the reference uh, in the uh, uh, a reference to the bike in the frame of the uh, of the video is really important. The other thing I, uh, I felt was important was that this particular camera has a 170 degree field of view. So it's practically looking sideways when you look at the edge of the pictures. Uh, and I think it's really important to get all that information in. So anyway, online submission went mainstream in uh, 2017, in August. Um, the original team was disbanded, which was a bit disappointing because there was a relationship there, but it was good that it was moving into the mainstream now. Uh, and the, uh, the higher ups in the police were keen to, to keep it going. So that was that was all good news. And we had a number of good successes in that we had because it was still email based, we could have discussions with the people who were making the decisions, even though it was now a fully public service. Uh, and that was great. Um, and uh, another case went to court. And uh, but there are still a lot of problems. Again, in that discussion, there was a huge amount of prejudice um, evidence and lots of uh, the, the same old fallacies, the my lane, your lane fallacy. If I'm in a cycle lane and someone close passes, the fact there's a bit of paint in between us doesn't mean it's OK. But the police uh, involved didn't really understand that. And the thing that um, was um, was the reason that this is particularly significant here is because whilst before we were dealing with local bobbies, now we were dealing with traffic officers who were displaying the same kinds of prejudices. And I actually uh, wrote a, a blog article about that. What kind of training do these people need? And there was bad advice. I mean, one officer told me that I should be waiting to turn right in that shaded area in the middle of the road there, in between two lines of fast flowing traffic. Uh, uh, being subjected to the risk of being knocked into the oncoming traffic by someone coming from behind. Uh, that was actually a road rage um, punishment pass. And the road position that I'd chosen uh, was used as a reason not to take further action against this driver, not even a warning letter. Um, so having those discussions made, meant that we learned an awful lot. In February 2019, a new portal was introduced, which was a, a website, and now you would submit your, your videos to a website and you would get nothing back. You'd get an acknowledgement of the fact that your stuff had been uploaded, but you'd get no information about what decisions had been made. And that was very, very disappointing because we could no longer really have a handle on, on, on what was going on. Uh, as it happened, I'd done, um, uh, I, I, um, made a request in September 2019 to find out what the results were in all of the cases that I'd submitted in the previous year, and that was 47 cases. And of those, 19 were issued with notice of intention to prosecute and Section 172 notices, which means that the registered keeper has to identify the driver at the time. 19 were sent warning letters and nine no further actions. Now, this was good. And that was a, that was a you know a fairly good um, response to those forty seven cases. But what was clear from this was that the decisions were very inconsistent. It was quite difficult to tell from looking at the videos which of those three categories uh, a case would actually go into. And the other thing was there was still a lot of ignorance displayed because the information that was given back to me had more th information than simply the decision. Uh, so it was things like no further action. Cyclist wasn't using the cycle lane in cycling in the middle of the road. That's why there was no further action. Well, obviously, this uh, officer didn't know about uh, correct road position and those sorts of things. And so we were still seeing from traffic officers a lot of prejudice and a lack of understanding of these things. So I think there was a lack of clear policy and a lack of training. And I'm going to come back to that. Uh, anyway, roll forward to this year, three years later we actually started to get notification of decisions and that happened at the end of March. It started happening at the end of March. So that meant that we could now actually start to do some analysis. And I, I started to do analysis of the, these decisions to have a look at, uh, at whether there were any patterns. We still didn't see any policy. We didn't know what the policy was that was being used to make these decisions, but at least we could analyze. And so in order to do that, I now had um, a 360 degree camera. I think it records over a whole sphere uh, and you can do post-production to to um, to reframe the uh, the videos and so on. So it was possible to start to do analysis. And so I started calibrating my cameras and, and bikes for distance uh, by putting measurements on the floor, um, 
drawing a, a grid on top of that with um, using the handlebars in this case to get the scale. Uh, and you can put that grid on top of a, of a, of a, a real picture from a, from a case and estimate the distance. That car was, the tyre was about a metre from my tyre, so the car was about 0.7 metres away. You can do lots of different head positions but to get a handle on just how accurate it is. And it is, it turns out it is pretty accurate. And then you can check it against features on the road. Uh, so that one was, um, was a bus stop. Um, there's um, a, a Pelican crossing there um, and those studs are actually half metre spacings and you can see that the thing lines up very nicely. So that's, that was great. And the other thing you can do is you can measure speed because most urban roads have a ruler on them and it's called the centre line or the lane markings and that those are either six metre spacings or nine metre spacings. You know what speed your camera is running at so if you count the number of frames it takes for a car to cover a certain distance you know what the speed was. So that means meant we could actually, I could actually start to do analysis and uh, I did estimates of the the accuracy of this and if you put all those in a spreadsheet it looks like this. Now I'm going to go and uh, look at the actual spreadsheet, the live spreadsheet that um, that I, I use. I'm just going to have to move some stuff on my screen because I can't access the, uh, the things I need to. So that's what the current state of my uh, my spreadsheet looks like. And you can see those um, those marks have come over time. Uh, that's starting at the beginning of the feedback. And as we go through time, those points have started to, to get added on there. Now, the first thing that you notice about this when you look at the colour coding is there are a lot of green no further actions mingled in with the warning letters. There are three cases where a notice of intended to, intention to prosecute was served and there's one case where a section 59 notice was served. The section 59 notice there was actually for a driver that was going well over 50 miles per hour in a 20 mile per hour um, uh, shopping street. So that's probably the reason for the notice of intended prosecution, not the close pass. It wasn't actually that close anyway. It was, um, it was, it was, it was too close for the speed, but it wasn't, wasn't exactly scary. Uh, now, just having a look at what this, uh, this chart means, if people don't necessarily understand it, on the horizontal axis, we've got distance. So the further up are you are to the right, the further away the car was from my right hand side. The vertical axis is speed. Um, and so you can see how serious these were. How do those figures compare to uh, the highway code? Well, the highway code says 1.5 meters up to 30 miles per hour, and then um, more space at higher speeds. So I've interpreted that to be two meters at 50 miles per hour, uh, which I think is a fairly reasonable thing. Now, the other thing is I don't need 1.5 meters at 10 miles per hour. So I've added another line on there, which, say, which comes out to about one meter at 10 miles per hour, which I feel perfectly comfortable with those. If somebody's on that line, I'm perfectly comfortable with it. Now, there are a number of points on here which I didn't submit because in those, those three, the, the gray ones there, um, I didn't think when I looked at the video that they were as bad as they felt at the time. And there are also two there which I didn't uh, submit because one because I ran out of time and the other because I made a mistake in the calculations. But I reckon my threshold for submission has been during this period about there. Uh, now, if I just get rid of those, uh, oh, just get rid of the non-submissions and the ones that I don't know about yet, that one I added today, that one I've, is well over, overdue and I'm, I hope it's not going to be missed because that's quite a serious one. Uh, but if we just look at those, you can see the level of inconsistency in there is quite serious. Now I'm going to come back to these uh, ones that were served notice of intended prosecution because I want to show you what it looks like, how, how bad it has to be before action is actually taken. The one that's in there was a bus driver. The reason that it's been um, uh, being taken forward is not because of the close, the one close pass at that distance, that wasn't that serious, but the fact is I told the driver as I went past at the bus stop, please give me more space, and he had another go at me further on and swerved his bus in towards me. So I think that's the reason for that. But this inconsistency, I think is a problem. And if we look, uh, at one point I had to make a, a, a query about a number of results that I hadn't heard about yet. So I put um, that query in and I found that in the list I got back, a number of them were, were noted, no further action resource related. In other words, they just didn't have the resources to deal with them. They were overloaded. And that's one of the problems that, uh, that exists there. But looking at, even with that, there are still inconsistencies. And just having a look at some of those, this one uh, is very inconsistent with all these to the right. If it's to the right and below 
then that means it's inconsistent. That's the no further action. These are warning letters. And there's actually one uh, warning letter that's identical to the no further action. Now, I think the reason for that one is one of the fallacies, the my lane, your lane, lane fallacy, because I was in a cycle lane and uh, the driver wasn't, uh, went past too close, too fast. Uh, but of course, there's, a, there's paint in there which provides protection. Another one, this is quite an extreme one, uh, no further action. This was uh, a driver traveling at um, over 45 miles per hour in a 30 mile per hour speed limit, um, close past 90 centimeters at that speed for me is far too close. Um, and yet it was no further action. I have no idea why it was no further action. Could be the my lane, your lane fallacy again, but it's inconsistent with so many other decisions. And I'll not do all of these. There are, there are quite a lot of them. Um, that one, um, again, lots of inconsistency there. Uh, this one I'm going to, I've brought out because it's not such a bad one, but the thing that struck me about this one was what was written. Um, most of the time you only hear what the decision was. You don't hear what the reason was, but this officer had actually put caps lock on on his keyboard and typed vehicle may have been traveling at 40 miles per hour, but the speed limit on this road is 50 miles per hour. Now, I never claimed in my statement that the driver was speeding. I was claiming that it was too, too close at that speed. But this sort of suggests to me that there's some kind of attitude going on there. Uh, unless maybe caps lock was on accidentally or is broken or something. Uh, and there, so there are, there are several of those. Uh, now, the other thing I looked at quickly was that the uh, a lot of the letters uh, were also, I was I received the notification long after the 14-day deadline for a notice of intention to prosecute and the Section 172 notice. So I suspect those may also be cases in which um, they're, um, they're, uh, they ran out of time to, uh, to actually do it. So going back from that, um, back onto the, the talk. I think that's, that's, qual that's quantitative data. I think it's useful also to look at qualitative information because that tells us a lot about what's going on. And it was actually another user that, uh, that was in contact with me that um, re fairly recently had this particular case. This, they submitted this one and uh, the, the, uh, the decision was no further action. Now I can estimate very easily from that picture that uh, picture, how close that car was. It was less than 50 centimeters away. Just looking at the width of the lane, where the position of the car is and where the, I can estimate where the position of the bicycle is. Um, so I'm fairly confident about that. But that no further action was a, was a mystery. And the response that came back to that person who was asked to remain anonymous um, was, uh, was this. And I've just underlined some, some important bits in this. Firstly, they said it may be closer than it looks for you, but it may not seem that way for us viewing. Well, actually, it's very clear from that picture. I didn't see the video, but the picture uh, shows that it was far too close. Next one, 1.5 meters is only guidance. Now I'm gonna come back to that because I think that's a very important point. Um, and next one, sometimes drivers cannot pass leaving the guidance distance. Now this is what I call the, uh, the driver had no choice fallacy. If there isn't room to pass safely, you don't pass, you wait until there is. But the officer has actually said this. Uh, we want to avoid being questioned constantly. They don't want to have to be accountable for their decisions. Now, actually, I don't blame the officers for that, for feeling that way, if there is no policy in place and they're not receiving proper training. So let's have a look at that uh, particular aspect. Oh, I said I'd, I'd look at the, uh, the only guidance fallacy that keeps coming up. I see this over and over again. Well, it's true that 1.5 metres doesn't appear in the law. It's not the law, it's guidance in the highway code. But the law is the Road Traffic Act. And the Road Traffic Act says that you, you should be driving to a standard that will be expected of a competent and careful driver. And in, um, in, the, uh, in, terms, in relation to dangerous driving, it's if your driving falls far below what be expected of a competent and careful driver. And uh, the dangerous bit refers to danger of either injury to a person or serious damage to property. I want to come back to that at the end because uh, that's important in relation to some of the, the cases and um, the two videos I'm going to show you very quickly. Um, however, I can't imagine any way, other way of thinking about this than the highway code guidance defines what will be expected of a competent and careful driver. So it's not written into the law 1.5 metres, but that guidance has to be, uh, in my opinion, what uh, constitutes uh, the expectation that's on a careful and competent driver. So 
we shouldn't just accept this. It's not the law, it's only guidance. It's not only guidance, it's guidance. Okay, so policy and training uh, was obviously lacking in all of this. So I put a freedom of information response in um, about two months ago, and I got this response back. I asked for policies and staff training related to decision making on helm and camera submissions. And the response said basically there are no policies and that there is no specific training. Now, we've seen from the evidence that, um, that I've seen, which has been difficult to get hold of, but it's still there, that actually um, there is a need for policies and that traffic officers, just being a traffic officer does not qualify you for making these decisions. There is further training required and we can see that from the comments, from the inconsistencies in the, uh, in the responses and so on. The other thing that they didn't pick up was there is work on policy in this area that was published last year, by, uh, led by uh, Detective Chief Superintendent Andy Cox, who is the lead on, uh, on road safety uh, for the National um, Police Chiefs Council, which is what used to be the Association of Chief, Chief Police Officers. So, I think we need to see these three things, policy, training and feedback. Policy because of, we need consistency of decisions, we need objectives and priorities to be clarified. Are they only pursuing, because of resources, only pursuing dangerous cases? Or should those actually be handled as dangerous driving anyway? Or should they also be considering inconsiderate cases? This is a resource choice. It's not about whether the law was broken or not. It's about whether it's worth putting resources into that particular activity. And I always come back to something that Mark said a long time ago. If poor driving alters people's lifestyle choices by making them too scared to cycle on the roads, that is a police matter, as it would be in any other area of life. So I think that's really important and clarifying where on the scale we should be in relation to, uh, to what, which cases are being taken forward, I think is quite important. Training, we've seen from the evidence, knowledge training is needed, bikeability training, they need to understand about role position and those sorts of things, because they don't at the moment. And we're still seeing that ignorance uh, in the decisions that are being made and the comments that are being made about that. Legal aspects and the status of guidance, I think that needs to be clarified to officers. Uh, and training on what the policy is. Well, of course, you need a policy before you can train people on it, but, uh, but you know, one follows after the other. And skills on interpreting evidence, I think those are lacking. And there's a whole lot of reasons why feedback is needed, why we need individual feedback, statistics and public feedback. The public needs to be aware of this. Dealing with drivers one at a time is never going to solve the problem. There needs to be massive publicity about this. So I think those things um, really need to be put in place. I, there's a whole list there. I'm not going to go through that list, but um, uh, because we're short of time, but they're there if you want to look at them. And I've discussed them in some of the blog articles I mentioned. Now, the, um, the last thing I want to do is just show you what um, cases look like that result in a notice of intention to prosecute in Greater Manchester. So this first one is uh, where I was going past a pinch point uh, and the driver did that. So that did lead, the driver also responded to my horn with his own horn. So that, that was the first one. The next one was a very recent one and that was um, a, a left hook, a very serious left hook. And I actually did a slow motion of this one for the, for the benefit of the police. Because if you look at this, you can actually see where I brake. And if I hadn't managed to brake, that car would have hit me at 30 miles per hour. So it's gonna be really, really serious cases before they're actually gonna take it to, uh, to take serious action on them at the moment. Comparing that to what was happening when it was the small team in the Serious Collision Investigation Unit, you can see that, that far fewer cases are being taken forward uh, than were be being taken forward at that time. Okay, that's me uh, done. I hope I've fitted in a reasonable amount of time. That was brilliant. Thank you, Graham. Um, just that's an amazing, that is just amazing work. And and I think um, also kind of drawing out from, from that sort of along the way, I mean, not just are they prosecuting and how are they prosecuting, but sort of understanding some of the systemic problems with how that's being analysed and, and whether officers are trained. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Um, I'm, I'm going to start by asking one. I wondered whether, I know that here people who've been submitting footage found that when the, they tightened up on the mobile phone use um, laws, they there was the, the police were not picking up on the close passes as as much it shifted to that obviously that was maybe easier for them to prosecute i don't know whether that's something that that you've noticed 
Well, I've I've um, I've not submitted that many mobile phone cases because the um, the camera I use and the mode that I use it in makes the evidence makes it quite hard to provide evidence um, that would support that. I mean, uh, Mikey mentioned that um, in his talk earlier in the year that uh, you you really need very high resolution images to see what's on the screen to show that they were actually using that. Um, uh, that phone. I know the law changed earlier in the year, which improves that situation, but it's still quite difficult. Um, so I've not, I don't really concentrate so much on mobile phone uses. And of course, I only see the cases that I submit. I don't see the cases that other people submit. Um, it may be that uh, that they're being overwhelmed with with those uh, those particular cases, and that's what's causing the the um, the overloading. That uh, means a lot of cases are just going going missed, really. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Ruth, do you want to, do you have a question? Yes, thanks. Graham, that was just awesome. Uh, and it's been in the chat a bit by other people. So for you and for Mark Hodgson and for Mikey, oncoming close cut passing is a real, real issue, especially A, in rural areas with windy roads, and B, most residential roads have such wide cars now. There's only room for one of you to get through and oncoming drivers can force you into what could be a door that could be open. So are any of you dealing with oncoming passing? Thank you. Well, I, I haven't had that many and, and I tend to be, um, like a lot of people are still cycling after a, a number of years, I'm quite pig-headed. Um, so I tend to hold my ground in the road and uh, even today I had this and drivers were coming at me uh, and I knew I could swerve out of the way at the last minute if I had to but I stuck in the middle of the of the lane and that dealt with the problem so there wasn't really a case to submit but I have a friend who um, who has had a lot of these on small roads a lot of these um, uh, oncoming close passes and she's not she has a lot of complaints she's not really um, been very satisfied with the response, but I don't know, none of us have really uh, of late, so. Thank you, just to say it deters family cycling, obviously, because you and I, yes, we're aggressive and most of the people on here, but if you've got a kid with you, no chance. Thank you. Well, well it affects me because I won't take my children on uh, out cycling. My children are old now, but I've got grandchildren. And I won't take them on the road, I wouldn't dream of it. Uh, thanks, Ruth. Um, I can see a hand up. Um, a. Kelly. I don't know what your first name is. Hi there. Yeah, sorry. I, I haven't been able to um, update my Zoom um, name. So it's Andy Kelly. I, I'm, I'm in Wiltshire. Um, re really great presentation, Graham. Um, you covered so many areas uh, that I've had frustrations with recently. I actually, um, after having so many close passes, I've, I've got a GoPro uh, 360 uh, camera. Um, and I've had very little success reporting close passes to Wiltshire Police. Um, I get a lot of the feedback that you presented today, um, things like um, uh, the highway code being only guidance. So that's great to see your response to that one. I, I really would like it if some way we can get um, the, the various police forces to actually understand um, the highway code, understand that it, it your, from your perspective, it isn't just guidance, it is the law. Um, so that's, that's a big one for me. Um, I've had problems um, getting follow-up information now. So I actually so I, I had a really bad close pass um, a couple of months ago. Um, I submitted footage from an old GoPro camera to them, which wasn't great, but you could definitely see. It was a private hire minibus overtook me going up a hill. Um, they were probably about 50 centimetres from me. Um, uh, with, two, with two kids on the back of my bike as well. Um, in, and it overtook me into a uh, cyclist coming down the hill. And uh, the cyclist was probably doing about 40 miles an hour down that hill. Um, and it could have been really, really bad. Uh, fortunately, he obviously didn't hit the cyclist coming down the hill. But um, the reaction I got from the police was that because the cyclist coming down the hill didn't report it and the highway code is only guidance, they weren't going to take any further action. Uh, everyone who I've shown that footage to, to has been horrified. Um, I complained to the police because um, I didn't think they dealt with it fairly. The, the complaints department didn't do anything. Um, uh, they just said that, there's, it, that the evidence wasn't clear. Uh, it is only guidance, the usual, usual reactions. And apparently I'm not allowed to take that any further now because um, close passes aren't covered by... Um, 
the uh, ind independent uh, ICPO, is it? The ICPO or the, the various bodies that um, oversee the police. Those bodies don't cover um, close pass reporting. Um, so, yeah, I, I would like to take it further, but I'm not really sure where to go now. So, um, yeah, and I think one of the one of the issues is that for, for a notice of intention to prosecute, um, there's a 14 day limit. If, if, if it's not done in that 14 days, then that's it. The, the police can't pursue it uh, through prosecution, through the prosecution route. Just to, to clarify on the, the, the 1.5 metres, um, the 1.5 metres isn't the law. It is guidance. Uh, but my argument is, and it is only my argument, and I think there's a discussion that ought to be had about that to make to make it very clear. Uh, but my argument there is that uh, 1.5 metres as guidance is related to the law in the sense that it defines what should be expected of a competent and careful driver. And that is what the law is, is based on, that, that specific piece of text. Yeah, and I think it's worth bearing in mind as well, 1.5 metres at 30 miles an hour as well. Yeah. So at higher speeds, that distance is lower. Sorry, sorry, it should be higher. Sorry, it should be higher. Thanks, Andy. Um, Stuart, do you, do you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Grant. That was a really good presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, we've had very similar experiences with Essex Police and lack of consistency. And I, I was wondering what you've done to get attention at the very highest level in the police. So we've written as the cycling campaign to the Police and um, Fire and Crime Commissioner so this is a strategic issue. They, they reply and say, no, it's operational. Um, we've written to the chief constable to say road safety is a priority for you. Um, and we've had some meetings with the team who process it, but they get very defensive and it's very difficult. Um, before you answer that, I just want to, one of the tips that we've employed here is every time it's a commercial vehicle that does a close pass, we put a subject access request in to say, please, can we have any CCTV dash cam footage from your vehicle? And that's great for bus companies because it's a real irritation for them. I actually had the bus station manager turn up to my house with a DVD of the footage because I had no other way of providing it on the cloud or by email. Um, and he turned up and said, this is a real pain in the arse. I'm going to make sure the drivers don't do this because it's taking an hour out of my day to put it onto a DVD and turn up to your house with it. Said, so, well, that's great. That's a result. So yeah, it was just, thanks for the video. How do you get that attention at the highest levels? Well, I mean, I think, I mean, we did have that attention at one point, as you saw back, back in um, 2017, around there, uh, because those meetings involved people at uh, chief superintendent level. So, you know, that's pretty, ser uh, pretty senior uh, level. And that's what really got things started. Um, but uh, since then, it's because it's gone into the mainstream, it's now sort of a low level operation. Um, I'm not exactly sure how, to, how to, to pursue it. We have made representations to the mayor of Greater Manchester, uh, the elected mayor of Greater Manchester, who is technically also the um, police and crime commissioner uh, for Greater Manchester, although he passes that to his deputy. Um, but um, but really, the, this evidence gathering, this information gathering was really to, to try and get to a position where those sorts of things can be done, because it's only it was only the end of March when they started giving us uh, information on the decisions that were being made. So now we're perhaps in a position we can start to uh, to, to make a, make approach the, um, the authorities again. Thanks. Right. Just out of interest, West Yorkshire publish all of their individual cases. So they, they have a data download and our analysis said 70% of their cases reported by cyclists, they take what I call robust action. That's an education course or prosecution. In comparison in Essex, it's only 30% with they take robust action and 50% of cases, they just send a warning letter. Um, so it, it's very inconsistent across the country. It would be great if someone like Cycling UK could do an FOI to get those levels across every force and collate the data to see how they're doing. Perhaps that's what the Warwick study will, um, into dash cam reporting, will find out. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, and I mean, I think at this point, I'd, I'd like to, there's this a question in the chat that Sylvie's, Sylvie's raised, which is, do we know, you know, what, what the range of inconsistencies are across police forces? And I wonder if we could bring Mark Hodson in now as well to, to you know, I don't know, Graham, whether you'd looked at what other forces do when you were doing that that work, or whether you've really just solely concentrated on on your own. 
and yeah, mark whether you can talk about whether you know you know what is the national picture yeah i have, I have a little experience with uh, with lancashire because if i turn right at the end of our street i'm in lancashire within 10 minutes so um but and and they I get uh, there are not that many cases, but I get the feeling that they are more inclined to take cases forward than Greater Manchester Police are, uh, at least through a warning letter. Very, I've not yet had a no further action from Lancashire Police. From my point of view, um, talking about the inconsistencies, um, it is you. You get the whole range, unfortunately, of, di of different responses. Um, within 20 miles of where I live, I can go into six counties riding. And I, if I was to submit it as a member of the public, I'd get very different reactions from, you know, total ignorance to a fantastic response um, from all the different forces. Um, it's something that is going to prevail, unfortunately, and it won't go until the police forces involved actually think about why they're doing it um we get very preoccupied as we've seen here today on individual cases uh, and what the outcomes are but from a policing point of view it, we do it just to change wholesale behavior that's it and it's, it's not a numbers game uh, at the end of the day it, it's something to, to change the psychology of drivers when they're out there um and we get very you know preoccupied with how many we're putting through it even my own force you know sort of west midlands we will do eight thousand offenses this year probably more than that mm -hmm. and it's doubling each year the, the problem with it is is demand and it won't be solved until it's dealt with at a political level nationally um quite simply um we've done some rough costings out it'll cost 50 million to solve the problem it sounds a lot of money but when you think it's 12 and a half for 50 million over two years, that'd be to get it up and running, it'd be self financing after that. And like I said, it sounds like a lot of money, but it's 25 fails days, you know. And if you did it properly, you, you'd reduce fails by a lot more than that. Um, that 50 million would give each force the ability to deal with every single submission that was put to them in a specialist capacity. The triaging is a specialist role, there's no two ways about it. Um, you need somebody with a vast amount of experience, not only in sort of the, the training aspect of a, a traffic officer. So, you know, are they a motorcyclist? Are they a, a driver? Are they a police trained cyclist, you know, or even a, a cycle trainer? But also the, the court aspects of it and, and knowing the law inside out and what will go through a court and what won't go through a court. But like I said, it, it's something that is solvable, but it needs to be taken on at a national level. It needs to be like the Department for Transport to say, you know, right, you're not going to do this anymore. I think a lot of forces at the moment do it because they think they have to, because it's been, it's been you know, almost like fest put upon them because some do it and some don't. And it, for a lot of them, it, it's more of a token gesture. There's, you know, it sounds a strange thing to say, but that they'll do it, but they don't actually think why they're doing it, what's the purpose of it. And the purpose of it is to reduce demand, that there's, there's no other reason why we would do it as a police force other than to reduce demand, to get those KSIs down and give us the ability then to concentrate on other things. As far as bang for your book goes, you're never going to beat third party reporting. It, it's that cheap and that effective, a change in behaviour. Um, it, it's untrue. And from a business point of view, with regards to triaging, you're probably better off taking two fully trained traffic officers off the streets, put them in a triaging office, and they would have more effect dealing with up to 50 yard offences a day through that triaging office, you know, being third party reported, and they would stand in out on the road with a speed gun, if you like. Um, and that's really where it is, you know, unless you get that political pressure um, and make forces understand what the benefits are to them of actually pursuing third party reporting to the nth degree and, and so it reaches its full potential of behavior change um you're not going to you're not going to get that standardization that we all crave across the country and you know i talk about my own force um and you know we are very good but even i hear some horror stories horror stories about my own force of people who submit stuff and, they, and then contact me afterwards you know um and so we'll add this reaction and again, you know, we're at a time of record demand for police forces um, against, you know, a backdrop of cuts across the board. Um, and the pressure is intense, but it's a case of that it's going to take a bit of investment and some pressure from outside the police, like I said, from, you know, the Department for Transport, 
um, if it's going to be truly effective and get to that point that we all so dearly crave. But um, if we carry on the way we're going, um, it's not going to happen and you're going to have those inconsistencies still. Thanks, Mark. Um, I can see there's two more hands up. Um, Adam and Sylvia, can you ask your, if you could just one after the other, ask your questions very quickly and we'll we'll cover them and then we'll have to move on, I think. Where's going to be? Shall I go first? Yeah, go for it. All right. Um, the question I've got is, is there any recommended camera systems that say have a guidance like visualization inside them that can then help the police and whether or not the police should be sort of recommending camera systems that people should be using because there's such a mix of them and some are really poor quality and maybe that's one of the problems here. Is it, is... Yeah, thanks. That's a good question. Sylvia, do you want to ask this? Yes, thank you. I think Mark partially um, responded to what I was going to ask, but if it's a training issue, um, just to kind of how can we find out how uh, how to make the case for you know a training nationally to, tr to train the police officers better um, and whether the case would be like because of you know the law resources uh, and the personnel that maybe to make yeah the business case to say if, if you do that right at the beginning then you will spend more less time doing it and just to compare with other types of training that the police receive Thanks, Sylvia. Um, who would like to answer those questions? I'll do the camera one. Um, the, the camera systems are, are pretty irrelevant, really. Um, when we first started back, you know, years ago, the cameras were, were nowhere near as good as we've got now. But as long as, you know, you've got that clarity of evidence that shows the offence, um, a lot of people get very much hung up on the um, being able to see the, the, the VRM plates of vehicles and things like that. You know, until recently, we never had HD in our traffic cars at work. You know, the cameras were awful. You, you, can't, you can't see reg plates or anything like that. We shout out the reg plates. Everything can be captured in different ways, evidentially. So I wouldn't worry too much about differing camera systems and how good they are. Um, the, the main thing is, is when people submit is um, most people have got a very good, you know, sort of uh, threshold when it comes to submission. Uh, and when you're triaging offences, you, you look for the hundred percent, so you can't have any doubts in your mind. And when it comes to close passes, I always say, if you have that sharp intake of breath, that's exactly what a magistrate's going to do when they're watching it as well. And, and they're the ones that will run. And we're not looking to, again, from a, what we're trying to achieve point of view, is run everyone. I wouldn't want to run everyone. I wouldn't want to run one that I thought, you know, even only had like a, an 80% chance of getting through a court case, unless it's 100%, you don't want to do it because you're weak and what you're trying to do. Um, and so, you know, um, camera system wise, um, don't worry too much about it. Just make sure that, um, you know, sort of it captures the whole offence, you know, um, simple as that. And training wise, going back to that, we, I always talk about transport prejudice and, and unconscious bias. The, the, the police force is made up of a cross section of society um, and you get the same unconscious biases and transport prejudices that you have in society, you know, sort of you, you hear and see them all the time and people have experienced them when they're talking to the police over the years. It, it's something that, again, if, if you did it properly and you got the funding and you got the standardisation, it would be eradicated at the, you know, sort of um, the, the interview stage, choosing the right staff. Um, but policing is very easy. Um, people have heard me say this before. You just get the right person in the right place at the right time, with the right skills and the right, right motivation. and Everything else just looks after itself. If you lose one of those things, then that's when things go wrong. And that's what you see when you see, you know, add the wrong sort of reactions to submissions. So, again, training wise, until you get the standardisation, you get the financial input. Um, to achieve standardisation and the thing becomes, you know, sort of um, self-financing. It's something that we're going to struggle to get rid of. Thanks, Mark. And I think we're just fine. I'm just going to let Graham have the final word because, I, yeah, I don't know what you want to say, but I'd really like well, you to say, where does it go next in terms of campaigning? What do you think? Right, well, the, the, the first thing, I, just in answer to all of those questions, the um, cameras, the one thing that I would say about the camera is a lot of these cameras have a very narrow field of view. And I think that is a real problem. If you don't get past the bicycle in the frame with the car, then the evidence is no, nowhere near as good as if you do. If you get the handlebars or the, at least the front wheel in, uh, then it's much clearer uh, because you know whether the car has 
is, is level with the bicycle or whether it's further up the road, you know, the, the evidence is just so much better. Um, the other thing is, that I, uh, on the second question, I think one of the arguments for the training and, and so on, and having a, a clear policy, is that um, if we know what the policy is, we can be more selective in the cases that we submit. And that means the workload on the people who are doing the triaging will go down. And, the, and so you know, the, there's, a, there's a sort of virtual circle effect there. So that feedback would really help to, to reduce the workload. Now, in terms of taking it further, I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, I've been gathering this data and, uh, and doing analysis. Um, I think the one thing that we'll certainly do here is to, um, is to again, approach, uh, well, Dame Sarah Story, who's taken over from Chris Boardman as our, our walking and cycling commissioner, uh, and through her to, um, to, the, to the mayor to see if we can actually get some pressure through the, the police and crime commissioner. Um, that probably is the, the best way for us at this stage. It's going to be very, very quick tonight, just to get ourselves warmed up and into this. So, um, I don't know if it's all sharing properly, looks like it now. Um, so yes, we're plagiarising the uh, good, the bad and the ugly. It's the good, the bad and the interesting. And this week, if I can scroll on, is continuous footways in uh, Glasgow, in the Merchant City. And I'm just gonna show you a couple of photos, and then a very quick scoot round on Google, and that'll be me done for this week. So the reason this caught my eye was uh, two or three weeks ago, I was in Glasgow on business, had a bit of time to walk around, and in the Merchant City, in uh, the old part of the town, um, a lot of the footways have been done up, probably about 20 years ago from what I understand and they'd built these lovely continuous footways um, and the things that struck me the most was the use of the curb so you've got these really nice uh, quadrant units you can see they've been shaped to take you from an ordinary curb profile to a sloped curb profile um, to give the ramp up into the various access points um, I was less happy about the curbs going back towards the accesses because that still made it a bit look like uh, traffic priority but large element paving either side, smaller elements where vehicles might overrun. And in fact, in many cases, vehicles aren't overrunning. Uh, we'll have a quick look at the zoomed in. So you can just see natural stone, nice piece of craft, craftsmanship there, um, dead easy. The footway at the back, as you can see on the last one, all that width there is flat. It's nice and accessible and you haven't got people having to sort of go down a dip and back out again. So let's jump across to where we are. Uh, so this is actually Miller Street, but there's quite a few examples around the city. Um, so yeah, so about 20 years ago, all the footways were redone. And you can see these uh, continuous treatments at places really, I mean, you can, you can see here, this one probably isn't taking motor traffic anymore. It's probably had its day. Um, and it's just nice, you walk down there and it's quite subtle. There's another one there, look. And you can find these all over uh, the Merchant City. So at some point, somebody thought it was a good idea. Uh, no idea who did it. No idea where they got the design inspiration from. But it's a lovely piece of detailing. And one final thing for Miller Street, which I also thought was quite nice, is not at every building. So I think this may have been to do with the redevelopment. But every so often, we've got the slightly coloured paving uh, uh, entrances. So from a legibility point of view, as you look down the street, you think, oh, hang on a minute, there's a building entrance, there's another building entrance, as well as the um, kind of similar palette for the, the old vehicle entrances. So, um, yeah, I think that's probably under the good and the interesting for this week. And that's me, Sally. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, we've got we've got some of those in the city in Newcastle and from probably about the same time. And then some others from like much earlier than that, I would say the 70s. It's quite interesting that there must have been, the, there's these moments where th things change and people, their, their designs change and then it goes back again. I don't know, do you, why, why is that? Is it? I'm, is I'm it finding this, I'm, I'm researching lots of interesting things at the moment. Um, and you're finding that stuff is probably going in 15 to 20 year cycles the, the so LTNs before they were called LTNs there are loads of those done in the 60s um 70s 80s 90s 
you keep coming back to it, continuous footways have been a thing for well even before we had cars really um and we keep finding things popping up again so yeah just interesting to find them um but unfortunately you can't find the history a lot of the time because people have moved on there's no records mm -hmm. um so yeah it's a big thing i'm trying to do is, is maybe capture some of these things get the message out there and really none of this is new let's just carry on doing the good stuff yeah and how people don't see the things that are already there somehow mm -hmm. they're invisible aren't they thank you very much that was great um and finally today we've got uh Ailey, are you there can you can you Yes, yeah. I'm here, Sally. Yeah, network holding out. Thank you. About, I must have been 18 months, two years ago, um, I was on Ideas with Beers back in the early days to talk about parklets and their role in LTNs, being potentially the heart of an LTN. Um, and a parklet is, uh, for people who don't know, it's when you take over a parking space and rather than having a parked car on there, you create a nice little uh, seating area for people to sit and have a chat, uh, to park their bikes, um, to read a book, to have a coffee. Uh, but they're extremely, extremely difficult. They are such a risk to local councils that um, it's just virtually impossible to get any done. Uh, and this is something that in the Parklets campaign we thought we'd do something about. We actually launched last year as the London Parklets campaign, but we've gone nationwide this year, which is very exciting. And we've got a couple of event, events coming up to coincide more or less with Car Free Day. I think there's an awful lot of things happening uh, towards the end of the week and over the weekend. So the first thing that we have, um, the slides aren't showing quite right, Sally, but I think people can, can see most of them. Uh, Saturday the 24th, we have got a ride round four different parklets. That's it. Thank you. Four different parklets in London, um, some commercial, uh, some uh, we're not allowed to use the, the term gorilla now, but um, community parklets. And the idea there is to showcase what can be done. You do not have to spend 15, 20 grand on a very commercial, very slick looking parklet you can build your own with uh, scrap wood and a lot of community effort. So the ride next Saturday will be going round a mixture of commercial and community parklets. And as an additional attraction, some of these parklets will be handing out cake. We found that if you provide a little bit of food, you get a very interested audience. So that's, uh, and we've got the, the uh, flower power theme to it so hopefully people will come with a few flowers and it'll all be very um light-hearted fun and informative and then if we go on to the next slide on the 25th of september we are organizing a pop-up parklet day we've got a guide on our website and the details are there on how to create your own pop-up parklet um we can arrange to come round and help you uh, set up your parklet. And we've got a competition and the judges, now get this, the judges are uh, people from the V and A. Now, if ever there was uh, a brand which shouted creativity and um, something that's fabulous, it's the V and A. So we're very lucky we've got two judges from there. They actually judged last year as well. So we're saying to the pop-up parklet creators, take a picture of your parklet, astound us, astonish us, be as creative as you can, uh, and we'll put you uh, in for the competition and you might win £100. So thanks very much for the opportunity just to tell everybody about this. We've got a smashing little video, which is on our website. Uh, so have a look and um, see what, what you uh, make of that. And I look forward to seeing anybody in London who can come along on the bike ride next Saturday. We're doing it with iBike. They're very good um, fellow campaigners in this area. So thanks all.